Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Welcome to Facebook Live. Um, it is 7-7, uh, so it, it seems like a really uh, auspicious number, 7-7-2021. Um, so it's July 7th here in the United States, middle of summer. Um, and we are thankful that Eileen has her AC back in the middle of summer. So welcoming our panel. Um, as I said, Eileen is here. She does an incredible job uh, keeping us streamlined with her insights as well. Uh, gives a lot of feedback. So th thank you for being here, Eileen, after a few weeks. We appreciate it. And then uh, we are also jo joined by um, April, who is a psychic and a spiritual teacher on our panel. Good evening, April. We are also joined by Travis, who is a musician and a spiritual teacher. Good evening, Travis. And then we are joined by um, Caesar, who is a um, you do channeling and uh, mediumship, right? And uh, a spiritual teacher. And we welcome Jillian back, uh, who has done her coursework on soul contracts. So she's going to provide some insights as well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, Caesar, were you going to share some good news or something? Or was it something not not uh, to be recorded on a panel? Uh, just not yet. Not just yet. Not yet. Perhaps, perhaps next week. Next week? OK. Thank you. So a uh, um, couple of weeks back when um, Eileen was on the panel. Somehow, April and I and Eileen got into a discussion, and Eileen said something about uh, you were frustrated that people don't treat their kids um, like they allow their kids to live through comparison, and our education system um, kind of promotes that. And so we wanted to um, like take our education system and kind of wrap spirituality around our education system, right? So the questions uh, that are going to be directed, um, let me move to full screen, um, are going to be around that. So, um, if you were to think of, yeah, the education system is what, 100, 120, 140 years old. We follow the British, so whether you're in America or you're in Australia or you're in the Philippines. I think we follow, everybody follows the British system, right? Which is 10 years of uh, schooling, then the four years of, uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, 10 plus 2 plus 4 plus the masters. The four, uh, 10 plus 2 is the 12, until 12th grade, um, go to school. And then the four years of uh, bachelor's degree, then you may do your master's, right? Where did you want to start about this, uh, Eileen? Sorry, Facebook's not cooperating with me. As usual, so I'm still trying to tag members. Um, I know when we were talking about it previously, um, I was talking about my frustrations with the fact that, um, like you mentioned, that um, kids are often getting compared to others when um, children should be able to be each themselves, like their own person. Um, everything is standardized here, in, at least here in the United States. Um, everything is like, everybody should be reaching this milestone by this purse, this point, and this milestone by that point. They should be reading by this point. They should be able to do this in math by this point. And let's test them to make sure that they can. It's just very, to me, very, very frustrating. Um, it's all based on, like I said, comparison. 
of the other instead of um, embracing each individual person and allowing them, like Jillian and I talk about a lot, like allowing them to be their own um, creator. But um, so I guess that's kind of where the conversation started was with that. Um, but I could obviously go on in any direction. <laughs> Sorry, right, I'm gonna get this thing sent really quick. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. So uh, the first thing I would say is uh, frustration would not be the right uh, action for it, right? We have to get back into our presence power and uh, see what needs to be done in the present moment. So there has to be a revamping of how we look at um, even schooling, enrolling children. So uh, my first question is, is uh, do we really need to enroll children into school at, uh, is it five years of age? They get enrolled in kinder, uh, pre-K and six years. So Jillian, you wanna get started on that? Do, you, do we really think that children need to be enrolled in a school and in a structured format at, five years of age? So I've done a lot of my own research centered around this um, because I, like Eileen and I, I know a lot of other people out there, I think there are a lot of things wrong with the education system, um, a lot of things that could be fixed. Um, so I, I don't necessarily know that kids at a certain age, I mean, that is really young for them to have to go and sit in, you know, what school has become. Um, I look at my own kids who are still in daycare and they get to play and explore and have fun. Um, and five is very young in my, well, honestly, any age if, with what education has become. I don't think any age is appropriate for what the system is today, at least speaking from the US perspective. Um, so I think the whole thing needs to be revamped so kids are able to explore and collaborate and have more freedom in what they're doing and learning. Um, so in short, no, I do think that five is young, um, if that kind of answers the question. Thank you, Jillian. Travis, what do you think um, is this mental pattern of uh, society that says at five years, the child needs to be enrolled in pre-K mm -hmm. and start schooling? Do you think sure. it's too young? Um, not necessarily. I kind of agree with what Jillian said and that, you know, it's, um, I don't think that five years of age is necessarily too young, but what are they being enrolled into, you know, and, and, um, and I think that, that, yeah, we, we could take a step back and take a look at learning and all of the different dimensions of it. Um, it and, and, and I agree with having things be more experiential and more tactile and more in, engaging and in, involved in, in different ways. Um, then, because I, I do think that for someone, you know, you know, at that age and um, it, that there needs to be, it's, it, it, it could be a real challenge for many children to, you know, sit at a desk with just pens and paper kind of experience. Um, and then you go, why do they want to look out the window? Why do they want to get up out of their desk or whatever it might be? And it's, it's because they're a child and they want to live life and experience and play and explore and learn, but not in the way that we're accustomed to. So I, I, I guess I'm just kind of parroting what Jillian said. I, 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 I think that it's not necessarily too young, but I think that we could probably have a better understanding of what uh, a human being and a child's needs are at that time. <laughs> so. That brings up another question. So what do you think is the, the right teaching for a five-year-old? 
like if you think, you know, like I think they start ABCs at five. They start writing a. Um, that actually starts before that. But if you haven't gotten it by five, you are learning it at five, right? You're writing ABC. So what do you think is uh, a five-year-old should be learning? Or what do you imagine? Like if, if this was an ideal school and ideally you were enrolled as a child, as a five-year-old. Are you asking me? Yeah. Okay. What would you, since you said it needs to be something well, different. I, I, on, honestly, I, I don't feel like I'm, um familiar enough with educating children enough to really be able to answer that question all too well um i mean it, and and from my utter lack of experience and and education in that realm i mean that what comes up for me is just that they they need to be outside they need to be um engaging with one another and and learning um, not just the concepts of like, you know, introduction to reading and writing and math and these things, but um, some, you know, like tactile application of these things and engaging ways to apply the concepts, um, I think embeds it uh, deeper and in a different way. So, but, but, to, but down to the specifics of what kind of the you know curriculum would be i would imagine that jillian or eileen would or you know somebody other than myself would probably have a better answer around around the specifics of it um but 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 in short really really just um you know to be physically engaged in the in in learning and and interactively uh, but both with what they're with whatever they're interacting with and with one another is what I would imagine would be healthy and 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 more fun and and uh, more effective. Thank you, Travis. April, um, what do you think a five-year-old should be learning, or what would ideally be your vision if there was an ideal school? What should a five-year-old, five, six, seven, eight-year-old be learning? Well, I can say that um, I that is one of the periods of my life that I do kind of remember is, and that's actually when I work with people, when I say to them, you know, what was your childhood like? Um, many people will say, I don't remember anything. There are some that I get that remember two, three years old, but it's very few. I do myself remember two, three years old, but most people remember kindergarten. I can usually take most people back to that time because that is the time that we are separated from our parents. It is a giant event for many traumatic event because we are separated from our parents and we are left here with these strangers while they are good teachers are awesome. We're still left with a stranger and it's a traumatic event. And I remember not wanting to be there, not wanting to stay. So when I look back, I remember that, you know, we did a lot of um, playing, singing, dancing, uh, ring around the mulberry bush was the one song I remember, uh, London's Bridge falling down. Then when my children, my older children, because I, you know, my children go from 33 to 13. So my older children, you know, it was a little more structured. School did start at four years old. Uh, head start, or you can call it early on, starts at three years old, that is in home, then it goes to four. Again, these children are taken out of the homes from their parents. And it was a little more structured, a uh, little more learning numbers and alphabet. Now, I can tell you from my younger children and from my grandchildren going to school, kindergarten is now first to second grade. First to second grade is now second to third. Grade. First grade is now second to third. And part of the problem is because America is so concerned with keeping up with the Joneses, with keeping up with China, Japan, all these other countries that seem to be much more advanced. So we're more worried about our test scores 
And unfortunately, the whole system where it, to me, it falls short is because the system starts looking at dollars versus score scores, testing. That's where the, it falls short. So I do think that we should embrace the fact that children's brains need to be expanded at those times. And that is a time where we can insert a lot of knowledge. We can open a lot of neural networks versus waiting. So I do think we should you know, take advantage of that. But I do think that the whole system needs to be revamped. And we also need to do something with the fact that you know, abruptly at five years old or four years old, we're taking these children and saying, here you go. These two strangers are going to be your friends now and you're going to stay there and you're going to, and now it, it's all day. These little kindergartners are there all day. It used to be half a day. Now it's all literally all day. So we, you know, eight in the morning till almost four in the afternoon. That's a long time. But when I bring that up, this is to me like, the our whole life needs to be structured because how do you expect a parent to work and afford daycare if the child doesn't go to school all day but the child shouldn't go to school all day but yet the parents why are we working nine to five who made up that rule why and come home at six and make dinner at seven and go to bed at nine what so this is a big topic for me and I get like and I but I totally agree that we need to fix this. Um, and it needs to be, I don't know the exact answer, but I know that the way we're doing it is not right. For example, I have grandchildren who have lots of ADHD and they will say, do you know that your child stands while they work? Well, standing while you work is not acceptable. Why not? Why not? That's that kid's mode of learning. Okay, some kids don't want to listen. Some kids don't want to write. They don't want to watch a movie. So I, I do think that we have a lot of work to do. Beautiful. Yeah, I'll stop there because <laughs> you continue. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, April. So Caesar, um, since April brought up the why do we have to work eight to five? Why do kids have to be in daycare eight to five? Don't you think that this is like a, what Eckhart calls our condition pattern that we have to be like a factory worker because of the industrial revolution, like we have to be ready for the factory, right? The blue collar shirt and uh, walk in into the factory and do our job but before that, the kid needs to be dropped off at school. Well, you just hit it on the head. Um, the curriculum hasn't changed in 200 years. And you said, us for the factory? And that's exactly how they're programming the children to get ready for how they line the chairs up and, you know, the specifics of the, yeah, so you know what I'm talking about. Um, and it's, I, God, where's Kelly? Kelly would, well, he would love this. <laughs> Um, he'd give you a whole dollar on this one, I'm sure. So um, they know what they're doing when they're putting their kids, uh, or putting our children in the classroom at five years old. Um, yeah, I, I just keep going back to uh, some stuff Bruce Lipton was talking about and how what you put into a, uh, to a child in the paradigm up till the age of seven is what they're going to roll with. So by enrolling them at five, they're getting a hold of that child real quick to get what they want out of them for the most part. You know, they're not teaching us anything about life. At five, you shouldn't be worried about a whole lot other than take the competitiveness out of it. I've got five children, so I'm going to tell you, I spent a whole lot of time down going around and around with the school boards um, for years and still do. Um yeah, at five, they should be taught self-love, and there is no competition. Take the grade system out of it. That's all about competitive nature. Why does everything got to be a, a competition with each other? Because there you have the separation. Everything's about separation. Um, you know, the, just a good example is kind of off base, I guess, but I'm um, off subject. 
you know, they're saying we got a terrible problem in this country with racism. Who's got a terrible problem? Racism was dead. The people that are out there saying we've got a problem with racism are the people that are racist. Um, children, age five, too early. Probably April. Yeah, I mean, you know, how how is it that it is like this and we got to work till six and come home at seven and have dinner? And get to, um, again, it's by design. Then it's the, the school system goes right in line with the whole political thing. It's, I mean, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a political, um, it's a political deal. Um, you know, the whole system is designed to keep us indebted. Um, for sure. And and then the children see mom and dad struggling, you know, back uh, way back in the early 1900s. So, um, uh, you know, uh, my dad was, uh, you know, a cement finisher, six kids, and my mother was a stay-at-home mother. We had the luxury of doing that today. Two parents have, have to work to support a family, drop your kid off in daycare, give them part of your money. Um, and then let them condition your child. They got a hold of your child for eight hours a day now, more than you see your kids. They're getting the best of our kids all the way around. Um, but yeah, they should be taught things like self-worth, love, compassion. Um, don't be competitive. It's not a competitive thing. You know, I had a daughter that was a straight age, smart as a whip and her older brother, a couple of years uh, older, um, he struggled. I mean, he was a C minus at best, but oh God, um, they were both equal to me and they should have been equal to the school system. Um, not one smarter than the other. And the kids frown on that. I know my son would be struggling at, at the table with a, with a, a problem and the, the sister would walk by my daughter and just walk by and tell him the answer and keep walking. He would get so frustrated that she was smarter. Than, but the school really does this um, and it's wrong. And I think it's going to take, um, a movement on a large scale to get it changed because if the people don't do this, you're seeing a lot of what's probably going to become a big thing. You, you see parents are starting to rise up now all over the country about the whole critical race thing. And you, know, you might want to cut me off. <laughs> no, um, but, uh, you know, it's good to see that the parents voice themselves. I mean, we were getting, I got my butt kicked in school. We had a, you know, woods class, we made the paddle with the holes in it. So it whistled when they smacked you on the butt. Um, yeah, I don't agree with, you know, teachers spanking your kid, especially with a paddle. Um, yeah, that's might be the only thing that's really changed nowadays. Um, but yeah, back to the subject, um, uh, too early, maybe, maybe not. But uh, what they're learning in there is terrible from five to seven. And them are probably the most vital, you know, years of a child's life uh, from how they're going to think, act, and everything else under the sun. But uh, that we never teach. I didn't know anything about energy, that all this is energy and everything. But I didn't learn that until I was, you know, 15 years ago. And I'm going into my hundreds. But um there, there's so much stuff that they don't teach the children that they should. There's money management, how to manage your money. They never, you know, um, what is the universe about? What's this vibrational frequency that, that happens? And, you know, down the road, I'm not saying early off, but at some stage, get to the good stuff. You know, history is what it is. I guess it's kind of important to know about history. Otherwise, you repeat it. So, okay, um, algebra, trigonometry. Probably not a waste of time. Um, but yeah, at a young age, they should be taught self-love early, right off the bat, and let that carry them. You know, it's probably got a lot to do with just the teachers themselves could really take a hold of this. And um, I know there's some awakened teachers out there who are amazing, you know, that kind of go against the grain. And I've met a few of them, and they say, you know, God, if they ever found out really what I do, I'd probably lose my job. But them are them are the true heroes. So, yeah, if uh, if the people don't do something, and I think we're probably all in agreement with this, then it's going to continue for another 200 years. But something should change. The classroom maybe should change. Uh, the curriculum should probably change a little to teach them what's important. And then it starts with life, the spirituality end of things. Um, no religion, spirituality. Teach them about life. What, what the, 
you know, what is this? Just what is this? It's love. Teach them that all the way through. Two plus two equals love. Where's your, where are you from? I'm from love. Let's just teach them love. That would be great. Thank you, Caesar. So is the understanding that it'd be okay if the kids started at 12 years of age, like studying? Until they were 12, they were taught mindfulness. And Eileen, I'll bring that to you. They were taught like mindfulness. I know um, Sadhguru has some schools that he runs in India where um, some of the schools are the traditional uh, British system, right? Going to school in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade. But then he has another set of schools that the kids only do yoga, meditation, music, dance until they are 12. They're not taught any ABC, one, two, three, nothing. Right, they're taught just. So, what do you all think of that, Eileen? Do you want to speak to it? Then I'll go to Jillian. All right, I have all kinds of things to say. <laughs> um, a couple of things is you mentioned the five-year-olds, like starting at five, and I wanted to add that um, I feel like what some of the others said, like. I don't think it's necessarily wrong to have a child in school at the age of five, but it would take significant changes to the expectations, to the curriculum, all of that uh, for it to be appropriate. Um, what they're doing now, like what's required students now, because I'm an elementary teacher, so I pretty much know what's going on from pre-K to sixth, seventh grade range um, and what's happening now at the age of five. So kindergarten level, um, like April said, is stuff that used to happen two years like after that. Um, so, I mean, there would need to be significant changes to the curriculum expectations, but also to how it's taught. Kids really at that age should still be learning through play. They should be learning social, emotional learning. They should be learning about their, like they said, their self-worth. They should be learning about um, emotional regulation. There's all kinds of things that kids don't get taught because it's not in our schools. It's not part of the standards. It's not part of the curriculum. The curriculum is math, science, social studies, um, and English you know, learning um, to read and write. That's that's the only thing that you're allowed to address. Address, And if you're addressing anything else, it's because you're doing it on <laughs> your own time or maybe your school, like my school is a responsive classroom school. So we have a very short period that's built into the beginning of the day to kind of establish community for the day. And I can do some mindfulness during that time. But there's no way I could address what fully needs to be addressed in a fourth grade classroom um, with the responsive classroom time. The amount of minutes that have to go into teaching writing to going into teaching reading, things that might I add, if you do research on, scientific research on, is not appropriate for a five, six, seven, eight-year-old. So you couldn't you can take a nap. I remember in India, the school that I was going to in second, third grade, there was a period that you took a nap. Like you put your on the desk, you put your head down on the desk and you, everybody stayed quiet. And the teacher would get some quiet time for that one period. No, There's we don't have quiet time at the kindergarten level anymore. It's not even at kindergarten level anymore. And in some pre-K classrooms, it's been removed from there too. So we're talking four-year-olds that aren't even given that quiet time space. Um, unless wow. you're in like a private pre-K facility that still holds that, you know, as part of their own um, curriculum, then no, no, there's no downtime. I mean, you have like a recess, but your recess block, which is really supposed to be time for physical movement. It's your little physical movement of the day. It's 30 minutes, but you really get 20. Um, like that's really the only time that's devoted to even moving. 
Um, and the good teachers, the teachers out there that, you know, do the research and know the kids need to move. Sure. Like I have kids that move about my classroom uh, throughout the day. I, like April brought up, I let kids stand. They stand or they, they do whatever works for them. Um, but not all teachers um, have that mindset. Um, but kids, if you really do the research, kids aren't even really developmentally ready to hold a pencil and write until they're seven. Yet our schools force them to do it starting at five. And in many cases at four, my son started school at three because of a diagnosis, which I'm not even gonna go down that road right now, but um, he started at three and was required to write at three. Oh, wow. So like, and I didn't do that research on writing until after that fact, but yes, yeah, seven years old. So you're expecting a five-year-old to write 10 sentences when really they shouldn't even be writing letters for another two years. And I'm talking about 12 years that yeah. they start writing ABC and learn how to write. And then, um, okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Charlene. And we have lots of um, feedback in the Facebook group. <laughs> Do not, not questions, just people um, talking about how the social emotional skills need to be um, addressed if there needs to be, you know, revamps to the system. Um, you want to read some of them? Sure, absolutely. Please do. Thank you. <laughs> resonate with so many of them. Um, and I, I am a school teacher and I take care of my students that whole entire year. I teach them to the best of my ability, the curriculum, but then I try and take care of them emotionally too. Um, so Louise, who's normally on our panel had mentioned that um, one of um, her children is um, not necessarily ready for kindergarten and she doesn't want him to feel pressured. She had just done a year of um, unschooling. So like not a formal school curriculum, um, but allowing them to learn creatively in different ways. Um, and she said it was definitely less stressful and um, blessing for her eight and 10 year old. I know quite a few of my friends who do unschooling. Um, Michelle says, I believe that social emotional learning is way more important at that age and through the elementary years, which is what Jillian and I both teach. Um, she also mentioned teaching of acceptance, compassion, empathy, sharing, cooperation, conflict resolution, um, all of those things. I agree with all of them. Um, and then, um, oh, some of these are repeats. E educational system is especially challenging for children with special needs, which I agree. But I do, like I mentioned the last time, I think a lot of the special needs comes from, and I know age, um, April brought up like ADHD, a lot of that stuff comes from the fact of the environment the children are being put into, that the school system doesn't necessarily work for um, a lot of children. And um, had they been in an environment that is more accepting of them and what they need, then they might not have a diagnosis of ADHD. Um, I believe that children learn math and reading, et cetera. Um, they choose what they learn and should not be rushed because it's all interwoven. Um, and then Ken, who I think is gonna be on here with us one day. I agree with what I'm hearing, planting seeds of what is being downloaded from the source and speaking from our heart, helping others wake up one day at a time. I'm blessed to see and hear you all. Um, Michelle added the educational system is just a reflection of the collective dysfunction, which I agree. We have to make sure we are efficient with every minute of the day, which is something that I have broken the habit of in my classroom. We cannot fill absolutely every single minute. It's ridiculous to even try. That's a great uh, insight that we are already being conditioned as a five-year-old that every minute has to be filled filled with something, right? Beautiful. Thank you. Jillian, did you want to talk about uh, the feedback that 
Eileen had given? Yeah, so there were a couple points, we'll see if I remember, um, that you brought up that I'm like, I didn't, some of it I didn't know. Like I didn't know about, you know, kids not even really writing until age seven or, you know, later than that. And it makes so much sense. I mean, I taught um, second and third grade and more so in second grade, but a little bit in third grade too, there are always those letters that the kids mix up and their handwriting typically um, isn't very good. And, you know, then it just worries the parents and then the kids feel bad. And it's like, you know, we understand as teachers that it's developmentally normal. That's what we say. But now it just kind of makes so much more sense as to why it is developmentally normal. If they're not supposed to really be writing, then it makes sense that they wouldn't, um, you know, be writing all their letters correctly and all of that. So that was eye opening for me. Um, and then I'm trying to remember what the other thing was. Something else big. I don't know. It went with, with all those awesome comments. I lost it. Well, I don't know. And what was the question? <laughs> Maybe that'll bring me back to it. About starting school. I think Puna was saying like starting like official like schooling more like 12 and up until what? that it would be more okay i i you know i really like that i i don't know a whole lot obviously this is all i know about um like how school is now but i love the idea of kids getting to spend their foundational years just learning about the way the universe works and like self-love was brought up. I mean, I'm just now learning about self-love and the power of self-love and like society in society today, we are taught if you love yourself, you're conceited or, you know, whatever other negative things that it's bad. Here we go. It's bad to love yourself. And it's so, healed. it's so healing and so powerful um, because our outside world is a reflection of us. So when we love ourselves, it allows us to love everything around us. Um, and it, it's so powerful. I mean, even just for me, I've been practicing self-love and my kids are so much more well-behaved and I haven't done anything different with them, but it's a reflection of me. And because I love myself, I'm able to give more to them. Um, so that's really powerful, I think, and just that they're worthy. And I think it would eliminate a lot of these paradigms that show up that a lot of you have talked about already. Um, but yeah, I think it would be really good for kids to just, just be kids, just learn how to be good human beings, forget all of the other academic stuff. I mean, kids are going to learn. My kids, I have a two-year-old and a three-year-old and they come to me with things and I'm like, how do you know that? Where did you learn this? And they, they just learn, they soak up everything. They're sponges. So they're going to get the academic piece without being formally taught the academic piece. And they're going to learn more, I honestly think, in that way, because they're learning what they want when they need it. And like, um, you know, little kids, especially, I mean, sure for everyone, but they, you know, we see that they develop at different pieces. You know, they work on what they're ready to work on when they're ready for it. So like my three-year-old now, he was very mobile. He just wanted to move everywhere. So when he was really little, his speech was a little bit slower to develop, but he was running around the room before most kids his age. Whereas my two-year-old was the opposite and he was more, I wanna sit and like learn what I'm doing. You know, over here, he could do something for like an hour or the other one would be across the room in five minutes. So his speech developed a lot quicker than, you know, and, and he was a little slower to start walking. So when kids are able to just learn what they need to and what they want to, they're going to develop just fine. They're going to learn way more than I think than what we are conditioning them to do. 
Um, yeah. Thank you, Jillian. So since we talked about self-love, Travis, and we all know uh, one of the, and April has brought this up quite a few times, right? That uh, all of us are our original sin or the original, um, what some people say, uh, I think in Christianity it said, right? We are born sinners. The original sin is that we come from a sense of lack and incompleteness. So this baby is born, they're born with a sense of lack and incompleteness. And now here starts the comparison at four years old. Oh, you cannot write A, you cannot write B. You, you're not holding the pencil correctly. You're not sitting properly. Look at the other 20 that are sitting properly. So what, is, what, what are your thoughts on um, or insights on wouldn't it help if the parents themselves supported mindfulness in the classroom? Like do like a morning period of mindfulness and an afternoon period of mindfulness or in the day with mindfulness or mm -hmm. meditation or some kind of presence practice? Sure. Um, well, I, you know, what, what comes up for me is when we have like a discussion like this and I go, well, is, what can I do? Is there anything I can do about this? Because it, it's easy for me to sit here and think about and talk about what other people could do. Um, but I don't know if that's gonna get them to do anything any differently than they already do. And the, my wheels start turning and I go, is there, anything, is there any way that I can take on this as my own responsibility? Um, and 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 put myself in the driver's seat and and do something about it that would really be effective and far-reaching um and and what comes up for me around that is the more and so and so as i as i say this i i i, I might be taught i might say it in terms of myself or others but i'm i'm definitely looking at it in terms of myself <laughs> but is that the more a person gets to know themselves on, on the, the deepest level, not, not the aspect of ourselves that began, which is it, it, that will inevitably end as all things that begin do, not the, 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 the person, because people begin and end, right? But the, it, the, there's something more subtle in us that doesn't change in time. So if we can be in that space where we're in constant contact with that aspect of who we are, the, the timeless dimension of who we are is the way it maybe Eckhart Tolle would phrase it, right? Um, that, that aspect of who we are, um, if I can do that, it helps this group. Um, and, and then, and it ripples out into, the, 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 you know, two of us are teachers that teach young children. So the more, uh, I'm, I'll, I'm just borrowing from Eckhart Tolle's language and around this and way of saying it, but so the more present we are, um, the more able I am in this moment right here and now to be absolutely present, um, the, the, that actually has a, a, a very effective and far-reaching effect that will affect children that I will, may never meet. <laughs> and so that's how all of us can do something really powerful and really significant about this right now. Um, I think that that is of paramount importance is, is, is our ability to be in that timeless dimension that, that and, and be in touch with that aspect of ourselves that can't be measured um that worth that can't be measured the more we can any of us can do that uh the better off everyone and everything is for it and 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 another thing that 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 comes up for me in this conversation is it, i i feel so confident about this being true that if somebody's teaching shop or some form of mathematics or whatever it may be or science or whatever it might be whatever the subject matter is 
they don't even need to talk about the deeper dimension of life. If they're living from that space, they're, they're teaching it in that moment. It's very, they're, they're subtly passing it along. And so it's important to learn about these things, but even more important than it is to learn about all of these things, to be in the presence of anybody who's actually living from that space and emanating the, they're, they're a living embodiment of the teaching um, and they're modeling it and they're, uh, they're transmitting it in a way that that is, is tremendously powerful and far reaching. It ripples out on and on and on. It's the same like how one might have a meditation group and at the end you would do like a meta practice and collectively reflect on the way that our shared practice is going to ripple out when we go to the grocery store, we go to get gas or we go visit our families or whatever. This, this practice of being in this deep space together, we know it's going to affect people in a, in, a, in a very positive way. So I think just taking the, on the responsibility ourselves of going, how deep does this go? How deep does getting to know who I am go? How deep does getting to know life go? Can I, can I be that in a casual social setting? <laughs> you know, can I, can I be in a very, very deep, very, very mystical, um, cosmic and grounded and um, loving space in a normal casual social setting? Because <laughs> if I can, well, good, good for, good for us, you know? And so, so I think that, that, that that's of paramount importance. Um, and I feel like I probably didn't answer the question. Could you repeat the question? <laughs> or I did said, I? I, I, I uh, the question was, since we were talking about self-love from what Caesar and Jillian uh, spoke about, so then that means, I mean, we are saying right now at 20 years age or 30 years age or 40, right, right. whatever age we are realizing that, right? Yeah. But what if we taught the children mindfulness yes. even I, at yes. four or five years? I think 100% okay. yes, that, that that would be tremendous. Um, in, those, in those formative years when we're really um, developing, you know, I, I, I was reading a book recently that was talking about how so many creatures and mammals are born so much more developed than human beings. The human mind is the most advanced organism that we know of in, it, it, you know, at all. And the, the thing is, is um, uh, it only does so much of its development in the womb. And those first few years, um, our brains, all of our gray and white matter are, and are, are developing so much. So if we can... Um, consciously put those teachings you're talking about, about self-love and, and meditation and things like that for children in those younger years, I think that that would be um, huge. Yeah. Probably uh, erase their sense of lack and incompleteness. So then they won't seek the approval, right? They won't it, seek it, the it, approval. It, it at least to a greater degree. I mean, I don't, I don't know that it would eliminate the ego experience because what you're, to me, what you're describing is the ego is comparison, that check, that goes with the ego, lack and, and incompleteness, that also goes with the ego. So all those things are, are, are having a self that's identified with limitations and separation. And so I don't know if it would eliminate the ego. I don't know that it wouldn't, but I don't know that it would. Um, but it would definitely help tremendously. Because I remember myself at uh, in second grade and first grade and third grade, right? I was like a brilliant student. Like I, I would get what would be the equivalent of straight A's. I was top of my class. So, but it, I remember it used to give me a lot of pleasure seeing the joy in the teacher because teachers love the one that is topping in the class, right? That's a comparison, right? So you, you, your teacher's love is showered more on you than the person that's not doing well. That's what was the initial thing that Eileen is talking about, right? 
So you're seeking approval. I'm seeking as a child, seeking approval from my teacher by excelling, but that's all comparison. My ego is, as a child, my ego is saying, oh, if I do this, then my teacher is going to give me right. approval, right? Yeah. So right. approval seeking. Mm -hmm. My point with that was that that is something that is ingrained in the kids from their upbringing before they get to us because I don't work that way. Like I, as a teacher, that's not how it works with me. Like I, you know, spread my love to everyone for everything and anything. Do you know what I mean? And so I see it. But over the course of being with me over the year, um, those that don't perform in that way um, get that love from me in another way. And they know that that's not what my focus is on. But that is definitely how the school system is set up. That's how parents um, condition them before they get to us. That's how this uh, again, I could go on forever. I really should stop. <laughs> Thank you, Ali. Thank you, Travis. Uh, April, did you want to talk about this uh, approval seeking? How would um, you think? So until 12 years of age, what if we left the kid to explore and actually brought them to mindfulness? So until 12, all they learned was knowing who they truly are. Know thyself. Um, right. Yeah. Well, I think one thing is, um, you know, we're kind of uh, looking at the ideal world. Um, and what I mean by that is I can tell you with all of my children, while I would love to have been their teacher, they won't learn from me. They won't. They, I cannot teach my children and I can know the subject. And they're like, you don't know anything you're talking about, mom. And I'm like, okay, because I never learned anything, right? You have so, a master's, right? <laughs> I, have, I have two associates, a bachelor's and a master's. And what my, one of my associates is in, is in science. So, but I do not know anything. Trust me, ask my children. <laughs> so, there is that dynamic going on that um, there are some parents who are not teachers and there are some children who won't learn from their parents. So this is where I think that we as a culture, as people need to change, because if we started out teaching emotional control, teaching self-love, teaching compassion, mindfulness, then perhaps we as people would be better or, and our relationships with our children would be and maybe our children would listen more and maybe we could, could communicate better. So I think the whole dynamic needs to change. So I don't know about 12, 12 to me, something about that feels like that may be a little late, but, but I do think that saying this child has to go at five, it's not right. I can tell you that my daughter Candace was not ready for school at five. Um, she was in preschool and then she went to kindergarten and, um, Candace was my child who would tell me about other lifetimes. And when she got into school, I actually had to hold her back because, um, in first grade, uh, I had to hold her back in second grade because this was Candace's response. I don't know why I have to learn this stuff. I learned this in my last lifetime. I'm bored. So I, she wouldn't learn it and she wasn't ready. She was in very much in fantasy land. And, but does that mean that she was dumb? Does that mean she didn't know? No. And I can tell you that her kindergarten teacher told me that she was behind because she couldn't fully tie her shoes by herself. Does that That's mean my child? That's the comparison. Right. So I think that you know, maybe five is a little early, but if it was more about, you know, teaching them so, you know, you could teach them the numbers 
along with these concepts of, okay, number one, the first thing is you are awesome. Number two, so now I'm teaching them one, two, you are source. You are, you know, I could do that and it would still get in there and then start at seven, eight with the numbers and the, the other thing that I, you know, um, I wanted to say here is that this comparison when I'm saying this is a whole human problem, I had this problem when my first girls with my first girls. And when I had my second set of girls, I didn't do this and whether it was right or wrong, but my first girls was, um, how fast were they going to sit up? How fast were they going to walk? How fast were they going to talk? Were they the first to sit up? All my younger, all my first three girls walked at nine months. That was an accomplishment for accomplishment for me. Who? Me? The parent? What? <laughs> I am competing through my children with other nine months old. Like what? Right? So that competition starts. Yeah, it, it does. So that competition of comparing, it starts when they're a baby. Which baby sat up first, right? That it is. So when Eileen is saying they come here like that, yeah, because who knew their alphabet first? Who could count to 20 first, right? So we instill that in, and I, I'll never forget. So when I had my second set, I didn't care when they sat up. I didn't care when they walked. I didn't care. I, I said, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to push them. And then I'll never forget when my daughter, she was in uh, sixth grade and I, she got her first D. And I was standing in front of her teachers and her teachers were like upset. And I was, we were at a conference and I said, I think I'm going to frame it. And they, you should have seen their mouth drop. And they were like, what? But I wanted to send that message to my daughter that I don't care what that letter grade is. I don't care. That's not my problem. My problem is, is that if you got a D, one or two things happen. Either somehow you disengaged from the environment, you didn't understand the concept and you didn't feel safe enough to ask for help, right? Or you just didn't care. Any one of those need to be addressed in a different way than discipline because you got a D. I seriously was going to frame it. <laughs> So if, and because I had removed all need for my daughter to accomplish through me, right? And to me, that's one of the core things that needs to change when you start with the parents and the system, then the kids. Thank you so much, April. So this is what uh, Eckhart calls role playing, right? In chapter four of uh, A New Earth, where the parent is deriving their sense of self from the child and how successful is a child. If this child gets a D, then I'm not a good parent, right? So parents need to disidentify themselves from that parental role and let the child be the way they are. If they're failing, it's not, you shouldn't even call it failing. They're succeeding at showing you where they are in their growth and allow that soul to flower however it's going to flower, right? Like I said last year, I think I, I had this conversation with Louise and even with April, uh, even with you, Eileen, right? Why, why are our parents in the middle of a pandemic worried about sending their kids to school? Why can't they just keep them back? right? Be safe at home. Who cares whether they study or not, right? If you're going to live until 70, 80, 90 years old, what is one year of loss in your life? Yeah, you won't study, but you wouldn't have learned by uh, 18. You learn by 19, or if you didn't learn whatever you needed to learn, by 19, you learn it by 20, right? But at some point in time, so here's my question, Caesar. How much pressure? I, I also see one thing that is deep rooted in the American society is 
this need for children at 18 to be ready to leave the house and do something. Like either they need to leave the house and go get a job or they need to leave the house and go get go to a college, right? The parent is in a hurry to get their child out of the house. So all the more the worry, right? If by 18, they did not finish high school, they won't be able to get the job, like work somewhere, retail or whatever it may be. So I feel even that is a pressure on the child, right? Like they, they don't feel safe. Children here don't feel safe even at home. They're about to get that safety net of being, their bills being paid, their food being there, rent being paid at 18, that it's gonna be lifted off and they'll be left out in the world, right? Go ahead. Yeah, pressure on both sides. Um, and again, it starts off at that magic number five. I don't know uh, about other children, but I don't know any, none of mine, including myself and my siblings uh, held down to the car like this. <laughs> they were trying to get me to go to my first day of kindergarten. That lasted about a week. No, no, no. That's almost like traumatizing. Um, and it kind of seemed like that just carried through uh, the pressure. You know, I think the bottom line is that, that responsibility even though they get our children um, at a young age and they're being embedded and conditioned in whatever way, you know, at the end of the day, the parents have the responsibility for some time to uh, adjust what's not right in the school and what is right in the school and then, you know, uh, strengthen that, strengthen the good stuff and discredit the bad and, and let them learn the difference of what's what and what's really important. Because um, much of it isn't the curriculum that they teach. What is important is that self-worth, um, you know, the responsibility of, um, of life, you know, and how life works. It's okay to fall on your face. You're going to, um, you know, teach your children that early and often. What is failure? There is no such thing as failure. That's a lesson. Um, and if you can carry that type of, uh, you know, your own curriculum at home as a parent, then you know, by the time the child is 18, I think everybody's anxious. The child's anxious to go. The parents are anxious to you know, watch them fly the nest too. And, it, you know, for me, I let my kids um, fall, you know, when I seen it coming um, because I thought it would provide a valuable lesson. And it did. And because of that, they're pretty much well on their way. Um, you know, again, life is all about the ups and downs, you know, from start to finish. We're going to, you know, arrive at our destination. Um, I don't think nobody goes straight through without bumping into the walls. How much you bump into the walls along the way is really up to you based on your decisions you make along the way. Um, so I would say, you know, probably more so than not, there is huge pressure. Um, let's say the child don't want to leave home. And the parent has the pressure of, okay, you're 18, you got to go now. Um, for whatever reasons. It might be selfish reasons, it may not. Um, but let's just assume it's all good. You know, you got to go out there and, and live your life now. You're 18. Um, whether you're going to college or not, this is your life. And, you know, I want my house back. <laughs> but I wish my children could live with me forever. You know, I would, I would welcome that all day long. You know, I think that's, you know, kind of what uh, is missing for the most part today. Travis had a really good um, uh, take on, on the whole thing. And then that's where it starts. What is your responsibility to, you know, God? I mean, if you could put that in motion and then, Get a bunch of people to jump in that's how you make changes you know that's really uh, talking about things don't do a whole lot it's going to take people to uh you know get involved and open your mouth the one thing i've learned over the years is that the, the real power you know from getting uh, going down to the school board meetings and such um for the past 27 years now 
my youngest is uh, 14. Um, so I'm still actively involved in that. But um, what I have learned is that people have the power in this country. I don't know about any other country, but in this country, it is the people who have the power. At the end of the day, if there's an issue with your school, the people have the right and the power and the opportunity to let their voice be heard. And it's not the first person, it's the second person that makes the difference. You always see that one person go up there and everybody's just laying back and like, okay, this lady's going off. I've seen this a million times at the school board meetings. And nobody really wants to go after them. They, they all want to, but they don't. Once the second person goes up there and speaks, then it's a mad rush. Then everybody just gets involved. And once they feel that power in making change, um, it's almost like an adrenaline rush for these people because they see that, wow, what we did was really powerful and, and getting, you know, change, whatever it is they're after. And that's how little tiny movement starts. But I've seen out here, um, outside of Detroit, I've seen uh, the school board flip flop probably 10 times, but there has been ample change uh, in this district because the parents were not in agreement with what, and how the school is going about conditioning their children. Um, most of what I'm talking about has nothing to do with what they're learning um, versus what they're not learning or how they're pushing the, um, I don't know which one, I guess the curriculum, but uh, getting off track perhaps, um, the stress of leaving the home. Uh, yes, the stress is real. And, um, and that's a scary thing for, I remember being 18, I left the house at 20. Um, I was anxious to do it. Uh, I was a little, I mean, I knew I always had a safety net, you know, as parents, the children know whether we say so or not, that they, they're welcome back if they fall on their face. Um, you know, mom, dad, mom, whatever is going to be there for them always, you know, assuming everybody is a loving <laughs> parent. Um, and that's a, that's a nice safety net to have because that just encourages yourself more to go out there and and you know change is the most scariest thing in the, in the world to people as we know um and that that's a life-changing ordeal that's a big that's a big time deal there you know leaving the home and then going off to college now as a parent um on the other side of the fence um it's equally as scary for the parent you know you want to see your child do good you have the fears of God, and if he gets involved with um, this crowd, you know, when your kid goes away to college, that's another nightmare for most parents, because we all know how the colleges are nowadays. It's uh, nothing but a frat party, um, and that's a true story. What are they really learning um, there? I don't know how college is set up versus, you know, K through 12. Um, you you talked about it. Um, I mean, what happened back in the 80s? I, when was uh, No Child Left Behind? Was that in the 80s? When they kicked that, that in? No, that was actually, No Child Left Behind would have been in 2000s, maybe okay. 15 years ago, about maybe. Yeah, okay, that's about right. Yeah. And, and what really was happening there is they just took, they found out the national average of dropouts was grade 10, right? Um, and yeah, so what they, of... yeah, the, the national dropout uh, average was 10th grade. So what they did is they took, the 12th grade program and advanced everything two years. So now you are getting the 12th grade education in 10th grade. And they figured you'd be better suited for, for life and for, for the factory. <laughs> um, if you did happen to drop out in the 10th grade, you would at least have that 12th grade, um, you know, knowledge. knowledge. Uh, and, and, you know, but where does that start? First grade. Um, and that is way too much pressure on the kid. Like I said, you shouldn't be reading or writing. I mean, you should be learning how to uh, um, yeah, communicate with the kids and socialize and the good stuff and teach them how to go home and get rid of that Xbox <laughs> for the love of love. Well, they're but, yeah, there's pressure on, on both ends. But as a whole like nation, they're comparing themselves us to other countries and 
starting us earlier so that we can be compared, but that's, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, no, it doesn't make sense. What they should be concerned about is that the children are well uh, mindful at the end of the day. That's what I think. I mean, if I was the head of the schools, the schools are in this country, um, it would be about mindfulness first and foremost. Um, and I think I would make every child uh, in order to go from the six, you know, from elementary school to, uh, you know, to uh, middle school, you would have to read the power of now several times. And then upon graduation, you would have to do a, a book report on the new earth. Mm -hmm. And then you graduate. That's, um, yeah, it's the school of life that should be taught um, at some just a little. I mean, make it a class for the love of love, you know. Put a put a, a program in there. Just okay. I'm taking social studies, history, math, and um, life. <laughs> you know, or mindfulness, something to do. Uh, but okay. So the bottom line is, they're not getting it in school. It's our jobs to provide that for them. Until they change that in in the schools, um, it's our job as society to work it and love and nourish. Um, even if you're not a parent, uh, like like kind of Travis was saying, how do I make a difference? Um, God, yeah, anybody can do it. I think managed my son's baseball team from it was uh, seven and nine year olds, but I ended up doing it for five years. And my job was to teach the children the uh, fundamentals of baseball: throw a ball, swing a bat. Um, but what I really taught them was two things: try your best and have fun. Period. And the baseball was secondary at that point. And um, and I said, not just in this on this baseball field. Take that home with you when you're cutting your grass. When you go to school, take that with you there, too. When you're with your friends, apply it there, too. So, I mean, everybody can make a little difference uh, if you have any type of interaction with our youth today because they are our future. So it is very important that um, that we provide them uh, love and confidence and stuff like that to build them up instead of all this negative stuff to, to break them down and, and not worry about when they fly the coop because um, someday they will. Uh, we will uh, stare out the window with uh, teary eyes and our face on the glass and wish them well and know that they're going to do good. Yeah. Thank you, Caesar. So your uh, what I heard you say is it's okay for children to leave, but they're always welcome back to have that unconditional love as a parent instead of stressing about just pushing them out of the home. Right. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's added pressure when you when you push your child out. Um, prepare them for that. Let them know early. You know, when you're growing, when you're you know 12 years old or 15 years old, and you're approaching your last few years of you know high school, you know they should have an understanding that, you know, I had to leave home or not had to leave home, but you know you're gonna wanna instead of you have to. You know, you might wanna leave when you're 18 years old and start your own life and your own family. Um, you know, if I had a 4,000 square foot house with nine um, bedrooms, God, I would love to have you and your family here, but we don't. Um, so maybe, you know, ease them into it. Don't make it like, an, make them want to go, make them want to go out there and, and get it after life. Uh, because I think that pressure is enough to make them fail. You know, versus I did this on my own um, and I'm going to take chances I wouldn't normally take. And I'm going to love every minute of it. And I know when, you know, Times get tough. I might lose my job and be unable to pay my bills, but dad don't have no money. But gosh darn it, things are always working out for me. <laughs> Thank you. So um, question for Eileen. How much of this is actually working? Isn't it a twofold problem that we have to work with the parent? Because the parent has to be ready to have the child, how much of that is a mental block or a limiting belief where the parent is saying, I don't want my child meditating. I don't want my child doing yoga. I don't want my child uh, just being in non-activity, right? Like not studying, but just random activity. If they were to make part of the day, like half the day of go play in the play playground and then come back and take rest, put your head down and sleep, right? Instead of having like formal activity, make part of the day, just be a child. So how much of that is actually the second part is 
the parent needs to be ready. Well, I think that's where it's going to have to start because honestly, what you see the children come in with, what they think the expectation should be, or what you hear the parents say the expectation should be or shouldn't be based on what they did when they were in school or how things used to be or how they are right now. Um, I don't think that any of this can come on a large scale without having the community and parent support. It's different for like one classroom where you can talk with your classroom family, but that's like one classroom. We're talking about changes to the system. That's why Jillian and I are doing what we're doing because we're trying to teach parents, teach teachers on like a larger scale um, to be able to make those changes for themselves. Um, and if those parents and teachers can be present and know their true power um, and have emotional <laughs> regulation abilities and presence and then we can target a system but trying to target a system a st system not like I said not at individual classrooms but like a whole system that can't happen without adults understanding and we're not there on the large scale right now. Thank you so much, Adim. Jillian, did you want to say something about this? That it's the twofold problem. It's uh, not just about the children need it, even the parents need the mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's been said, but you, we are you know, a product of our environment. And we, we start with our parents. That's where we go back to, you know, at the end of the day as well. So if your family is not mindful and they're not aware of mindfulness practices, then, you know, when you're younger anyway, you're not necessarily going to carry that through because those paradigms will come back. You know, as kids get older and can make decisions, um, not for themselves, but I don't know if you know what I mean by that, because obviously kids can make a decision, but, you know, when you're like a teenager, you can, I feel like you have a little bit more of that rebellion, you know, you can kind of go your own way, if that makes sense. Um, so it might be a little different as they get older, but yeah, I definitely think that it starts, it starts with the parents um, and the teachers, you know, everyone, the adults in the situation, understanding it and practicing and studying this mindful material so that they can embody it and then therefore teach children how to embody it as well. Thank you, Jillian. I couldn't think, I think we've exhausted all topics. Did you have anything else, uh, Eileen, that you wanted to discuss? No, I just wanted to bring up a couple of things that um, <laughs> Michelle said on our post. I said, you should, really should come to the Zoom <laughs> because she said a lot of really great things. Um, I'm scrolling back a little bit. So um, society values academic proficiency and intelligence so much to the point that kids are overly anxious and stressed. Um, and then of course we add social media into the mix and it's really a perfect storm that leads to a lot of psychological despair, which I know that um, Caesar was kind of hinting at um, the anxiety piece earlier and I've brought it up before. Um, she added later, um, instills a lot of fear. Will I be smart enough, good enough, pretty enough, successful enough? just enough um, and that too resonates with a lot of things that I bring up because that goes back to that comparison like it's not being smart enough like smart enough for who for what like that's that whole comparison thing like 
this this student is really good at math and this student really picks up on reading quickly but this student is a creative writer and this student you know is really good at um the engineering piece and so like kids why can't kids just be themselves oh it drives me crazy um and she, then she just said um not every student's meant for college she's talking about caesar's um comments not every student's meant for college there's many other options, technical, vocational. I know many people are not successful with a degree, are successful without a degree, um, but they're resilient. Doing something that you love, even if it doesn't come with a huge paycheck, paycheck is undervalued in our society, which I agree with that all, so. so. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, thank you, Michelle, for all the input and Louise as well close to our heart that she's always there online, even though she cannot be on the panel. So this brings a question to, uh, to my mind, April. What does it take to discover, to allow? So, you know, we took so many years and now I'm realizing that my greatest gift is doing like the spiritual teaching. Instead of uh, realizing this, so what if my schooling had been different where I had already realized this? How different would I have been as a person? That's, a, that's an interesting question. If we start out uh, dynamic, we, we can only go up from there, right? Um, and if we start out in these environments like when Travis was talking, it kind of reminded me of this that old, old, tells my age movie karate kid of wax on wax off you know that presenting that environment and you know using these skills as practice and as you know our tools um i think that the when you're talking about this it, you know eckhart brings this up many of the teachers bring this up that currently in this paradigm um we need our struggles right to learn but the one that we're wanting and the one that we are talking about if i started out dynamic then i don't necessarily need my struggles anymore to grow and learn right and that's that whole golden age thing that we, we talk about often that we want. Um, and, and my hope and your hope and our hope is that we get there. So I one of the things that this brings up for me is that, um, you know, talking about that original sin is, so you have a child that perhaps, and most of the population actually, we grew up in these homes where you know, like I said, we're being compared at nine months old, or we have parents who are just not that supportive, or just maybe not that loving, or they don't know how to love or so I've got this whole dynamic of not being good enough at home. And then I go to school. And I can't tie my shoes. And I can't get all the gold stars. And I can't get all the so here I'm not good enough either. So now I've spent how many years until I graduate? striving to be good enough failing right and i think that um for me again when i figured out that i didn't need anybody else's approval the only approval i needed was my own i do not seek outside of myself whatsoever in the teeny tiniest way, any approval. When you learn to do that, when you only seek your own approval, and I, I'm not saying that in a way like I'm stuck up or I'm, I don't care. I mean, I don't care what other people think, but it's not in a rude, mean way. It's in a presence way. It's in a way where, because I know who I am inside. I am part of source. I'm part of divine. That gives me infinite worth. If I inherently have that, I was born with it. I don't need any other approval. 
I don't need the good grades. I only need the good grades if that's what I choose to do. I choose to excel in this area. I choose to learn this material, but not to be good enough or to be better than. So the key to this is going back to the, to the one truth that you are source. Therefore, you have all worth. You are infinite. You don't need any approval, any grades, any stickers, any stars, no cookies. You have them already. Just check inside. I got a whole pack of chocolate chip Ahoy cookies in there, a whole one. Got the whole thing, right? <laughs> I have all the cookies I need, all the stars I need. They're right here. So if we can do that and we can teach kids that from the beginning, well, how do you think you did today? How did you do today? Did you try your best? Right? How, you know, and if they say, yeah, okay, that's awesome. If they say no, and then you have that mindful conversation. Well, what part do you think you didn't get? Would you like to work on that? Right? So then you're teaching them to take responsibility. So then you've got the whole package. Well, let's work on that. Let's grow. So that's how, this is how I look at it. And this is how I made the transition. The moment I decided that I had infinite worth and I didn't need anybody else's approval because I already had sources approval, that was it. It was the magic. That was the magic. And that needs to be taught when they are six, seven, eight. And then learn to explore what is the unique talent. That needs to be taught from birth. I did an Indian sweat lodge once with my friend that I mentioned um, okay. here, my friend Jackie that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, I did an Indian sweat lodge with her once and there was this couple that was there and they had this baby and they, they were a new age couple, you know, so, you know, they had all the beads and the feathers and the flowy clothes and, you know, they were that hippie type and they had a baby and I watched this, the dad pick up the baby and said to the baby, you're just so amazing. I just want you to know you are so amazing. You're so awesome. I just love you so much. That's where it starts. Beautiful. Thank you. So Jillian, you, did you want to talk about uh, what would it take for the child to already know what is, how do they explore why are we learning when we are 30, 40, 50? What is my infinite potential? So, yeah, I, I feel like I'm just gonna go off my personal experience. Like I'm 29 and like I'm just learning about all of this. And my life has changed in the most profound way possible. And I always wonder why couldn't I have learned this when I was young? And I know that there was a reason and I know I had lessons I needed to learn along the way. And I do understand all of that, but I feel like, um, I feel like if, I feel like kids would still have that you know, you're still going to learn the lessons you need to learn. But if you have the, the knowledge of the way things work, of who, you know, we really are, if you have the awareness, if you have the presence, if you have the strategies in place, you know, like April was talking about with how, you know, how to deal with different situations, you know, it, I feel like, kids world would be different and then in turn our world would be completely different and I'm trying to think of how to like it, it it gets me when it's like we have so much potential 
we there is so much more for us we can be so much better and yet here we are in this system that we've been saying that every not everyone i guess obviously but most people hey hey i'm gonna say hey because we do right we we totally dislike it it doesn't work it doesn't fit not a whole lot of good comes out of it and when things could be so much better and we're not making the change it's it's frustrating and i know that's not a great word to use um maybe saying that we have a lot of learning and growing to do would be a better way to put it but it is it is hard and when i i have been bringing this material to my kids i started learning about all of this in like february so by the time i was really comfortable with it it was more like march april ish and um I'll put it out there that I took my social studies and science time and I started teaching them this stuff because I felt like, you know what, with the crazy year we've had, they're going to get more out of this material that I'm going to teach them than the science and social studies that I'm going to, you know, half ass because I've got some kids on zoom and I've got some kids in my classroom and I don't have all the materials I need and I can't get so I was like you know what I'm just going to do what I think is best so I started teaching them this I started every morning we had a gratitude practice we did a meditation it was a short one but it was centered around mindfulness for kids and the difference I saw in my students in just even a few weeks was so profound. And if people could have seen that difference, it would have, I mean, it spoke volumes that just in a couple weeks, my kids were so transformed. Imagine what it would do over their lifetime. And just to give an example, I had a student who he never attended any Zooms. So most of the year he wasn't there. Most of his first grade, I taught second grade last year. Um, so most of his first grade, year end of year he wasn't present most of second grade he wasn't present so he started coming when we went um hybrid which i don't know eileen when was that like march or no i think for most it was probably like january i didn't start till march some started in january okay i don't, I don't know when you're back group and forth started. yeah <laughs> Um, but somewhere in there. Um, so that's when he, so he missed a year of school. So, and he hated school. He was one of those kids that would walk in slow, drag his, you know, book bag across the floor. Don't want to be here. Never smiled, never participated. Very apparent, you know, that he didn't want to be there. Um, head down on the desk, all of that. And he got to the point that he was like smiling and he knew we did affirmations and he was so excited to like lead our affirmations and he was excited to not everything but he was more excited to participate and it's just the change and even just him I was like holy cow and all i've been doing is like a little bit of teaching them you know some of these concepts each day so i don't know if this answered the question but i I feel very strongly, like I know all, all of you here do that. This needs to this needs to make its way into people's lives, um, everyone, but kids. It will transform our world. Thank you, Jillian, and thank you for taking the time to be on the panel. I know you have little kids, so you've gone above and beyond. So I'm grateful for it. Thank you, Caesar. Caesar, you want to talk about uh, what would it take to develop a child? Like, we are realizing this late who we need to be, right? Um, God, I mean, if you could really have an understanding of who you are at an early age, yeah. Uh, yeah, you would be more advanced a lot quicker. I mean, you would still be who you are today. Yeah, probably with a little more garnishing, that's all. Um, I feel like one day to happen where they actually instill that into the uh, curriculum. Um, and if not, 
the kids will always have their parents at home, like April said, um, giving them that nurturing and that um, you're amazing and all that good stuff. That's where it starts. But yeah, I mean, how important is it to get, uh, you know, to that level that as a whole, imagine the world, what a beautiful place it would be 10 times as it already is beautiful now. Um, but yet, yeah, if you realize who you are sooner, I mean, again, here's, you know, like all of us, I didn't have a clue um, of who I was, what I was, uh, none of it until my, you know, forties um, to think that if I could have got on that path, you know, in my teens, even um, how many more people could I have affected along the way is the, you know, the big picture there. Yeah. Because every time you light a candle for somebody, they in turn light a candle for somebody. And, uh, and that's, you know, that, that kind of stuff spreads like wildflower. Um, but, uh, that's the type of stuff that I get the earth changed and shifted and all the other good, beautiful stuff. It's, um, vitally important to, uh, understand at some point in your life who you are. And like Eckert says, you know, most people don't get that understanding until sometimes they're on their deathbed. Um, but they do have that opportunity um, to realize, you know, when he was talk talking about uh, the millionaire, the billionaire, and, you know, on his deathbed, he didn't, uh, he finally realized none of it was worth anything. You know, the Rolex, the BMW, um, you know, and that's when you kind of find out who you really are. You know, when you, when you figure out what matters in life and what this is all about and when you can figure out who you are a lot of the answers just come naturally um i mean they're quite obvious i mean it's called clarity you know at the end of the end of the day um everything just becomes clearer you know life becomes clearer when you know who you are the sooner you know who you are the sooner uh, you can find peace and spread that kind of peace and love to other people and help them realize who they are and what this is all about um so what was the actual question? The stress of understanding? How would, how would a person, how, what could be changed in our education system for children to discover who they are early enough? Instead of going through this, uh, oh, I need to do social studies and math and algebra problems. What can we change in our educational system? Just implement uh, self-awareness. I think that that subject alone will do it all, right? Um, first and foremost, we are vibrational beings. Uh, Crash Course 101, everything in the universe vibrates. Um, you know, chapter three, life as we know it. Um, yeah, uh, to implement something like that would have to change to get away from whatever their uh, agenda is and then teaching us, everybody for the past 200 years, the way they teach us um, has to change. I think, I think this happens in about another 10 years. I, quite honestly, I feel like the system is about to, everything's going to change obviously, but I think it starts with the schooling because that's at the young age when, you know, you're, you're building the human up. Um, I think in this system today, it's designed to keep the human suppressed. Sadly, I feel that to be true in my heart. Um, but I think this changes real soon. I do. I feel it. And I think that whole curriculum is going to change. I think the way they do things are going to change. I think the message um, that they teach is going to change. Um, and I think it's going to be all about self-worth, love, compassion, empathy, um, you know, what really matters and that will make the human thrive. Um, that's how you get this world to be a beautiful place at the end of the day. And it starts, I mean, can you imagine, can you imagine the impact and the change that could be created if the school has something like this and to what degree they have it? Because now you have every human, at least in this country, that has to go to school, gets this type of knowledge and understanding um, 
at some point during a 12 year period. Um, could you just think about that for one second and what this world would look like to have implemented that what we talk about once a week could be spoken about and taught five days a week, just an hour here, an hour there, you know, condition them for the right reasons instead of the wrong. And that's how you know that the system is all bad right now because they're not producing the type of humans that walk around smile like the, um, the ladies, Jillian, and then um, I mean, have been touching on is that, you know, it's, it's kind of evil. If you think about it, it's, it's, to me, it's nasty. Am I full accepting of it? Do I have hatred for it or anger? No, it is what it is. Um, I made my kids read the book, God darn it. Um, several times they have. And, and now it's like, oh, man, I wish I would have learned this when I was, you know, in seventh grade. That's what my kids tell me now when they're in their 20s. Um, and I'm going, I know I wish I would have read that book 40 years ago before you were born. But um, yeah, to implement these good things. Um, so hats off to Eileen and uh, Jillian for doing what you're doing. And I wish you guys um, great success at this because it's going to take stuff like this to get it done. Somebody's listening. Keep doing what you're doing and it's not going to fall on deaf ears. If you're passionate about what you're doing, um, I'm sure there are a whole lot of other people out there that feel the same way as you. And I'm one of them. I'm sure April's one of them, Poonam as well. Um, but again, if you can just stop for a minute and think what this world would look like, you know, on that type of a level for every child to cross through these, uh, um, you know, th this opportunity, because here you got to go to school instead of teaching you all this garbage and stuff that's important. I'm not saying it's all bad. It's not all bad. Um, but to put the right things in there that are important instead of keeping the people just smart enough to be a factory worker um and stuff like that um it's so important it's so huge yeah the, the school can actually do this and they will um 100 confident they will and it's not going to be too long um i just hope i'm alive to see it happen um, because wow what an awesome world this is going to be thank you so much Caesar. so i kind of feel that uh, what it would take would be, it seems like, you know how jo Dr. Joe Dispenza says, um, if you keep thinking the same emotions and the same thoughts in the past, then the past moves into the future. So I feel as parents, parents have been thinking that having the corporate job, having the nine to five job. So, uh, when we disconnect as a collective, we disconnect from that thought process of we need to have a nine, we need to be a lawyer, doctor, um, uh, whatever, mayor, uh, or a celebrity, like an actor, like a hero, a heroine, musician, uh, like a Michael Jackson kind of uh, singer. When we disconnect from that, when the stories come out, that this person left their Wall Street job and now is making jams and they're so successful, right? Like uh, there's this woman, uh, Tabitha Brown on, I don't know if y'all have watched her and I'm, I can share her video, but she is somebody three years, three or four years back started like a video. She, she went bought a sandwich out from Whole Foods, which was a vegan sandwich, right? And the way she described the sandwich as she was eating, it snowballed into um, having millions of followers in, on Facebook, having millions of followers on um, uh, Instagram. She started vegan cooking, right? Uh, she cooks vegan uh, recipes and she started vegan cooking. So until we hear success stories of that kind, that you don't need a college education, you don't need any kind of education, but you can do what you were internally unique skill. You know, we are countless beings with some unique talent. Until those stories come out, the collective will not change. So more, I, I love watching her to because of that inspiration that she is somebody that just went out and did something that was her unique talent and the universe supported her, right? 
yeah, we hear about the people that went to the movies or Tyler Perry or Oprah. Those are like outliers. But now we are beginning to see these people that, oh, I left my Wall Street job and I started a jam factory, right? Just preserving, but different kinds, right? Putting pepper in, like uh, making it savory jam, maybe putting cayenne pepper in your strawberry jam. So they're making a different kind of flavor profile of their jam and they became so successful. So when all those stories come out, then parents will support their kids that you don't need your school education or your college education. You be who you were meant to be in this world, right? So I'm hope, uh, what I'm wishing, and that's what I keep encouraging everyone to do as well, is go figure out what you want to do and support, your, support that potential within you. You're meant to be something. But take the time, go into presence practice and figure, figure out in your meditation who you want to be and pursue it. Because as Eckhart says, it's not in the destination, it's in the joy of the doing, right? Each task that we do, it's in the joy, like this is joyful. Having a conversation with all of you is joyful. Having a conversation with everyone that's online today is joyful. So. Aline, did you want to say something about the, you can wrap it up. You started the conversation. Uh, the privilege is yours that you should wrap it up. So, and you can say thank you and end the day as well. Okay. Thank uh, you. I was just going to say thank you to everyone for contributing to the conversation. Those that were online and those that were here. Um, and when Caesar was talking and he said, um, just sit and imagine what it would be like if the kids, you know, knew what we knew. Um, and I just, I had goosebumps. It's the same thing that happens every single time, every week that Jillian and I meet um, for our podcast and our YouTube video, like every week, every time I'm like, cause we have conversations about things that their parents and teachers don't necessarily probably understand. And the kids obviously are not in a place where they understand. I mean, some do, um, but it just, it's so mind blowing. And I feel like sometimes I just have a never ending case of goosebumps. And when Caesar was talking, I was like this, that exactly, exactly. I think it's gonna take some time, but I think that it can happen faster than we think as long as um, everybody who knows um, gets that message out there. So I'm very grateful for everyone who participated tonight. Thank you so much, Arlene, for choosing the topic. Have a fantastic day, everyone. Many blessings, honor, and a privilege. Much love. Good night.